and welcome to the AI Sustainability Leaders Panel. I'm really excited by the panelists today. We have Alma Cardenas, the founding member and senior manager at Microsoft AI for Earth. We have Emily Cherry Tissier, CEO of Whaleseeker. Ivan Henry, CEO of Nectar. Indra Dembaka, CEO of Overstory and Topher White, CEO of the Rainforest Connection. Welcome. I'm Kathleen Buckingham. I'm Director of Sustainability for Tentree and Veritree. Well, starting off, you are all founders or CEOs of your organizations. Can you tell me just a little bit about how your organization came to be and what gap you were trying to fill? Um, I'll pass over to you, Topher. Thanks. Uh, so again, uh, my organization is called Rainforest Connection. We're focused on, on all the ways we can use sound uh, to both measure and protect the natural world. Um, and all this sort of came out of this, uh, this idea that, in fact, there's really great tools that promote sensing. We'll hear about that from, from some of the other people here on this panel. Um, but so much of what you can learn about the of nature itself comes from sound. And it's also one of the least sort of technologically utilized tools based on really just kind of logistical issues. Um, so this all started for us because uh, we realized that we could use the sound of chainsaws to, to you know, to actually alert people there on the ground uh, to issues and be able to send real-time alerts to, uh, to actually have them go stop it. So over the course of the, about the last eight years or so, we built up a network across the world to be able to detect chainsaws in real time, uh, send alerts to local partners, and it's, it's since then morphed into a, a large sort of um, global bioacoustic network uh, that allows us to, to use AI to pick out what's in, happening in nature. Wow, that's fascinating. I'm really excited to dig more into that later in the discussion. Um, passing over to you, Indra. Yeah, thank you. So I'm Indra, CEO and co-founder of Overstory. At Overstory, we apply machine learning to high resolution satellite images to better understand forest and vegetation. So we look at things like tree species, tree health and changes over time. And at the moment, we help electric utilities to reduce the risk of wildfires and power outages caused by vegetation interacting with power lines. Uh, myself, I have a background in computational intelligence, worked as a data scientist for several years, mainly in advertising technology, learned a lot, worked with a lot of great people. But around, I think, five years ago, I decided I wanted to do more of my skills than selling more ads to people. And climate was really top of mind, so I wanted to contribute to that uh, cause and help fight climate change. And when we started the company, we really believed that better data is needed to improve decision making about our forest and vegetation. And I think broader, I mean, we are really focused on on the satellite images, but really happy to see Tova here as well. I think there's many solutions here to and, and collaboration is needed to fight this uh, massive challenge that we face. Thank you. And passing over to Emily. Thank you. I'm Emily Shahid to say the CEO of Whale Seeker. We use AI to detect whales from remotely sensed images. So satellite images, um, aerial uh, from airplanes or drones, uh, forward facing infrared. And we detect whales from imagery because uh, it allows us to have a really precise area and space and time for whale location. And it's a bottleneck for a lot of different industries, uh, ranging from shipping and port management, oil and gas, conservation. They all are very different uh, industries, but they all have the same problem, which is needing fast, accessible uh, whale detection from imagery. And so that's, that's what we, we provide. Thank you. Um, moving over to Alma. Thank you. Um, I am part of Microsoft Environmental Sustainability, and we are focused on making sure that we have technologies that can help all of you guys. Um, I see that all of you are working with remote sensing technologies, and it is extremely hard. Um, I think you have, you know, to have, you know, several PhDs uh, cross collaboration in your team in order to get the technology to help. Uh, so we are trying to low the, lower the barrier by, you know, creating, you know, technologies that are easy to be adopted, leverage AI and machine learning to help us resolve the tremendous problems and challenges that we have to sustain Earth systems. 
Earth ecology, biology are one of the least um, digital transformation um, uh, industries or areas. So we are happy to help that to digitize, you know, earth systems so that we can all work for preserving them. Thank you, it's very needed. And I'm passing on to Evan. Great, thanks. So at Nectar, we make uh, sensors and technology that go inside the hives, of, uh, beehives to monitor their health in real time. And a third of the food we eat depends on honeybee pollination, which is valued over $500 billion of the food supply chain depends on animal pollination. Um, and so despite people maybe think associating honeybees with just honey. It's a bigger issue of uh, food security and pollination of a third of the food we eat. So by having data in real time to assess the colony health can help beekeepers reduce their mortality rates, which has been in the news on headlines for years now, but as well as growers to make more informed decisions on how to strategically and better improve pollination rates. Thank you, Evan. And I guess this brings us to the larger question that's been in the news all week about the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Their sixth report um, was put out this week um, and an urgent call for action. Um, and you touched on this, Evan, and maybe I can go straight back to you, but in what ways do you address urgent climate needs or what plans do you have to address urgent climate needs? That's a great question. So I guess the biggest point of contact with climate change and the beekeeping and agricultural industry is um, hives dying. So because about a third to 40% of hives die each year, the amount of new hives that are imported, shipped around the world, recreated just to meet the rising demands of pollination, which often um, in North America involve beekeepers trucking their hives from Florida and Texas to California come springtime for almond pollination. Um, the amount of transport of new colonies is one of the biggest kind of uh, causes of greenhouse gases in the industry. So being able to reduce the mortality rate and also being able to bring less stronger hives to pollination sites will is something we're focusing on um, with the grants with the help of Sustainable Technologies and Development Canada to help uh, reduce emissions in po pollination. Thanks. And I guess moving over to TOFA, and how, how does your technology help speak to urgent climate needs? So in our case, we, uh, if our mission is to protect forests, uh, protecting forests is one of the fastest, cheapest ways to, to, to fight climate change. Um, it's actually the second largest contributor to climate change is the destruction of forests, uh, which is largely driven by, um, uh, you know, illegal logging uh, in a lot of areas. So illegal logging will usually create the roads through which the rest of the forest gets cut, gets cut down. Up to 90% of logging in most tropical countries is illegal. And if that's illegal, there's a mandate to stop it. So we work with local communities um, to be able to get alerts and, and actually motivate them to stop it uh, and incentivize them to stop it, which is a major challenge. But it really comes back to this... Um, in fact, there are people, there are people out there, not necessarily governments, not necessarily NGOs all the time, but just local communities who can be incentivized to stand up to really large scale uh, legal operations, which are so profitable that they will, um, they will sort of be rampant without, without us uh, working to stop it. So uh, just by protecting forests, we can have a, a massive effect on fighting climate change. Um, you know, every square kilometer of forest is equivalent to a thousand cars off the road for a year, in terms of the amount of carbon that it stores. And there's, you know, millions upon millions of square kilometers of forest that are accessible for protection with local communities. So that's, uh, that's part of our answer um, to address this. Help local people protect their forests. Thank you. And I guess staying on that forest theme, um, I want to move over to Indra. Um, how does your technology complement um, this or, or do something else that, that Rainforest Connection doesn't do? Yeah, no, I think climate change is really the reason why we founded the company uh, four years ago. And I think everyone in the team is really uh, driven by helping mitigating and adapting to, uh, to climate change. And as Tova mentioned, forests are key for it, uh, especially protecting what is already there. I think there's a lot of attention for reforestation, but 
to me, first priority should always be keeping the forest we already have. That's the simplest solution. But as we all see, it's not as simple. So I think over the years, we've really looked where could we as a team uh, have the biggest impact uh, by using our mix of backgrounds and expertise. And the more we learned about wildfires and what was causing them, we felt this is something we, we our technology can really help solving now, or at least contribute to, to the big issue of wildfires caused by power lines and interacting with, with, with vegetation. So we doubled down on that and that's our key focus now to make sure that there's no more bigger forest or forest fires, or at least let's help to reduce them. I'd like to follow up there because I saw in the climate report that with a, an additional, one, well, the 1.5 degrees future, which is, is difficult to get to at this stage, there'll be an increase of um, wildfires by over 40%. Um, how will your technology help address that, that increased demand? Yeah, I think what, what we're really lacking is indeed granular of information about the trees, the mix of trees, the health of trees. If we see what, what destructed all our forests, like the bark beetle now in Europe, but also happened in Northern America before, like we really need to understand what is there and how it evolves over time with the changing climate. And that data is fortunately lacking at least on a granular enough information at scale. And I think that's where we contribute to. We need data, we need to measure what's there to improve how we treat forests. And I think it's not only about measuring and, and <clears throat> um, monitoring it, but also learning from local communities, as Tove also mentioned. There's so much we can learn from indigenous people living in harmony with, with, uh, with forest for such a long time. So I think collaboration is key to really get this uh, problem tackled, but there's a long way to go. But data is, is part of, of the solution. Thank you. And obviously seas and sea level rise, acidification is, is in the report as well. Um, how, how are you addressing urgent climate needs, um, Emily? Yeah, so, uh, you know, obviously the, the, the oceans are a big, uh, a big climate change concern. And we believe that humans and uh, whales and uh, all biodiversity can exist in ways that can thrive, that where we can all thrive. And so, but we're lacking data, just like Indra was saying. So what we want to do is, is make it easier for people to monitor for whales or other uh, marine mammals and uh, make it easier to make decisions in real time. And the only way to do that is with more data, easily accessible data, that's that, so that it's not a bottleneck for any of those industries. And so that's, um, that's, that's what we're doing to, to try and, and make sure that when we scale up, we, we think about climate change and we make sure that the ecosystem of the, all the biodiversity is, is uh, pristine and that humans don't have as much, uh, you know, effect on them as with no data. Yeah, I think data is key. And I think what you're all doing um, to, to increase um, the availability of data and generate data is, is fantastic. And with that in mind, um, Alma, you know, to what extent are you seeing trends move towards addressing climate needs in, in what you're doing? Green report. Uh, we certainly have much more work to do, though. So at Microsoft, we are addressing uh, sustainability from our operations. Uh, but also, as, as you know, uh, all the data centers that we use, you know, are, you know, the deep learning algorithms that we are producing, hosting the large data sets that we need to have these systems um, are requiring our energy hungry, they require land to put these data centers and they require energy, water, you know, so we are contributors. Every organization, every business, our economy depends on, you know, all these nature services that we transform, you know, and we are not as a whole, you know, economy is not taking into account 
the damage to Earth and the damage to these systems that we depend on, quite frankly. Um, I just wanted to say one caveat, uh, if I may, we are not saving the planet, we are saving ourselves, right? So the planet will be fine, maybe not as beautiful as it is today, but we really need to save ourselves. So anyway, uh, in sustainability role that Microsoft has is one, take care of our own footprint, use our best, which is our technologies to help us get there. And most importantly, bring others along, right? So we are, uh, you know, uh, uh, our work works, we work with all industries. Industries need, all of the organizations need to start taking care of their sustainability. And we hope that technology can get them there, account for car carbon, understand their footprint on ecosystems, help them address, you know, we will need all of you guys to provide solutions for organizations that need to know what is our impact on forest. Example, carbon offsets, right? What is it good for us to invest in carbon offsets that are going to be burnt or die by wildfires, by, you know, insects. These are the type of risk assessments that we need to make as a business and that all businesses will have to make. So we need all of you guys on hand, you know, to help us address these challenges. Thanks, Alma. And thinking of challenges, I mean, it's been a challenging year or challenging 18 months, however long COVID-19 has been going on um, globally. How have things changed for you in your different organizations during the pandemic? How have your priorities changed? How have you shifted priorities? Um, I'd like to, to pass um, to Evan. Sure, so before COVID started, we were seven in the company and now we are uh, 22. Uh, which is kind of going against the grain during COVID trends. But I think that uh, can be explained by people still need to eat uh, three times a day. Farmers are still farming. Um, and we've been focused less on working in the office like everyone, except for our hardware team, which needs to work uh, with the tools there, um, but have been much more kind of uh, dispersed and on the ground. Um, so we had to, or like uh, have been hiring and working with coworkers now across uh, Canada and North America to support our clients and beekeepers that are pretty much all over. Um, and surprisingly, it hasn't changed that much in terms of the industry, given people still need to eat. Um, so, so that has been kind of a helpful constant for us during COVID, um, but also very challenging in terms of actually coordinating the travel. Um, one of my coworkers went to California for the Almond Pollination for, uh, in uh, February. Montreal, where we're based, had an 8 p.m. curfew, very strict lockdown, nothing, other uh, essential services were open, but our, um, Collaborators and clients in California were walking around with no mask and had a bit different cultural and kind of political um, uh, ideas there that was a little tough to adjust to um, or dangerous to adjust to in some cases. Um, but otherwise, it's been uh, still the field season, still the field season, and agriculture still moves on. So we've been trying our best to adapt in a safe fashion. Um, but sometimes uh, when you're in the middle of a field with farmers, uh, it, uh, you just have to roll with it. Thanks, well, it's great to hear that your, your, your business has grown and it just shows the importance of what you're doing um, during this time as well. Um, passing over to Emily, I mean, have you seen changes in, in whale patterns as well, for example? Yeah, not necessarily. I mean, yes, uh, there have been changes in whale patterns, but the biggest change that we saw um, before COVID 
whale visual whale detection is mo was mostly done by human eyes. So human eyes looking out of an airplane window, human eyes off the bow of a boat or from shore, and then scanning a computer screen for the images that were taken. And with COVID, all of a sudden, putting 12 biologists in an airplane, you know, 14 hours a day uh, to run transects over the water wasn't a safe thing and wasn't allowed by the government. So people were scrambling right before field season to find safe alternatives for biologists and for marine mammal observers. And so similar to Evan, our company has grown during COVID and it's and it's also changed course a bit too where we've we don't have an office everyone works from home um, we're running really lean uh, so you know we don't have any we don't have a lot of extra extra fees we're doing everything as uh, as cheaply and as conservatively as possible just because we saw how crazy things got and we got through it because we are also a, a B Corp company. And so we make sure that we have a sustainable plan for growth. We don't want to onboard anybody unless we are sure we're going to keep them. Um, and so by taking this sort of safe uh, and making sure that we have a long runway, we're more resilient to the ups and downs of the pandemic as well. Um, and also sort of more trustworthy with our clients. We can, we can roll with the punches a lot more with them. Um, our clients have had a lot of trouble, you know, readjusting to how do we still get our work done? How do we still get our aerial surveys done if no one is allowed to leave their home? So it's, it's been uh, brainstorming with them and, and really being flexible and compassionate that has, has sort of been our saving grace, you know, for people working within the company and also working with our clients. We've generated a lot of trust and that trust, especially in AI, is such a valuable currency. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think you know, that's how we've adapted to COVID and their practices that we are going to be continuing and bringing into the future. That's fantastic. It's fantastic that you can have a lean approach and, and learn so much uh, about the business through COVID as well. Um, moving over to the forests um, now and Tova, I mean, what challenges have you found um, with um, data collection or throughout COVID? Yeah, so because because what we do has to do with ground-based sensors, uh, we generally had to kind of re-engineer, well, re-engineer a significant amount of, uh, of our technology to be able to be installed by remote partners. Um, as with a lot of tech companies, as we're a nonprofit, but as with a lot of tech companies, we've it's actually been a very interesting and, and uh, you know year and a half of growth during COVID. Um, so lots of lots of new tools we've been able to build, lots of new partners to be able to bring on because there's a need for being able to measure these, these ecosystems from afar. Uh, and because what we do allows you to like, almost be like you're on the ground with the amount of data that you're getting, um, but not be able to, you know, not have to be there. Uh, we are able to, you know, make a case for why acoustics is able to do so much more. At the same time though, so it's been fantastic in terms of our ability to build a new technology and building partnerships. However, at the same time, it's been a devastating year for a lot of these environments. We have like a, a firsthand view to how that's happening. We can you know, the, there's generally a decline in governance across um, almost all ecosystems that we see, particularly Southeast Asia, like Indonesia, India, um, Brazil, um, and Peru. These are places where, you know, where the economy gets depressed. And of course, it's the environment and the vulnerable people that pay the price. People, again, are, are trying to flee from cities and being pushed into indigenous areas where um, people are most vulnerable. So it's actually, um, it's been a devastating year that we unfortunately have, are, have very, very precise data and been able to measure in the areas that we monitor. Um, you know, upticks in, in uh, exact, you know, assassinations and environmental defenders. Um, it's, it's, so it, it feels good to be more capable as an organization, as a company for coming out of this, but we've seen um, major setbacks in our, in the impacts in the areas where we, where we work and with the people we work with. And uh, I think that we can expect this to happen every single time there is almost a regional or global disaster. Uh, environment will be the first to pay the price and the people who protect them. 
That's that's awful to hear, Tofa. Um, I guess Indra, does does this resonate? Does what Tofa say resonate with you in in your line of work as well in the forests? I think in terms of impact or that we see on the forest, I mean, uh, it's it's devastating, of course. And indeed, uh, we do see what Tofa also mentioned. There, there's definitely more activity in those regions where I think we were doing better, of course, not good enough yet, but it's definitely, I think, a decline in forest cover in those countries that picked a little bit up. Uh, but I think for us, because we've been focusing mostly on the, the wildfire topic, which was also a devastating year. So, uh, but I think work-wise, we've been very lucky and the same as Emily and and as I mentioned, we grew the team. It was five people in the office before COVID. We're now 18 people uh, remote first as well. So very familiar stories there. And I think for us, in, in terms of our customers, what changed a lot is that they got more used to remote meetings. And that helped us actually to grow the business where we have very, very traditional industries like forest industry, but also um, electric utilities. They weren't used to, to buy remotely, but I think that has been positive for us that we could scale actually our business faster than maybe before COVID because we didn't have to visit all of them uh, in person. But I think long-term, what Emily also mentioned, the relationship is important. So we are building those relationships remote now, uh, but we'll have to see how that evolves over time uh, when this will take uh, much longer as well. Thanks. So, uh, so you see... Yes. Just jumping there with Idra, one, one of the really amazing things that I, that I sort of think about when I hear you speak is how, you know, the places where we work, it's about lack of governance, like areas that are, there's no transparency and so they get destroyed. But fires affect everywhere. You know, it's like, it doesn't matter if it's a, if it's a, a, a rich economy or a, a remote place, like it just destroys rampantly. Um, and as you mentioned, yeah, I don't know. It, it's really important that you're working on that. Um, and it affects everyone equally almost. Thanks for that, Dover. And yes, feel free to, to jump in. Um, I'm guiding the conversation, but it'd be good to, to, to have more of a conversation there. Um, I'll just go quickly to Alma as well. You know, at AI for Earth, have, have the priorities changed during the pandemic? They have, they have not. Um, you know, if anything, you know, as you know, Indra mentioned, I am thrilled to see that you know, technologies like Zoom, for example, are proliferating and we are stopping travel. Um, at Microsoft, you know, we do a lot of business travel to meet our customers. So one of the things that was highlighted in this uh, difficult times is that digital business are more resilient and are able to continue to operate if they have, you know, things like, you know, Zoom or Teams to conduct meetings. Um, I hope that now that we know that we can have remote meetings, that we can continue to adopt this practice so that we can stop, you know, business travel uh, because it does have an impact. I'm sure that you guys through remote sensing know that, you know, that this past year is so, uh, emission reduction and so uh, quality pol uh, the air quality pollution being you know improved because of this situation so if we could just grab onto that right and uh, continue to push forward on the sustainable agenda that would be great but if anything you know I think that more and more the work that all of us are doing here uh, continues to be um, imperative that we succeed, right? Thank you. Yeah, and I guess thinking about success, um, you know, there'll be people in the audience that are thinking, gosh, how did you do what you're doing? How did you become founders or CEOs? Um, they might be very interested in data and data science, but if people were thinking of starting a startup about AI and um, sustainability, what advice would you give them um, as people that have been through it themselves or as with Microsoft, you, you support um, organizations that go through those kind of um, transitions? Um, I, I'll go to you, Emily, first. What, what advice would you give um, people on this journey? I 
I really quickly, I wanted to just um, go off of what Alma was saying that it, the, the, the same thing, we saw the effect, the positive effect that COVID had where everyone stopped traveling. This also was the same thing for the oceans. They were a lot quieter. Uh, there weren't as many ship strikes. There, there were, were population of fish and marine mammals in areas that they weren't seen before. And so what I'm really hoping happens for, in, I mean, all travel and, and transportation, terrestrial and maritime, is that we, we when, when we're coming back from COVID, we take that into consideration and we don't go back to business as usual. Um, so I, yes, that I, I hope, I hope that that is what the direction that we're moving in and that people follow through with that governments follow through with that because I know that entrepreneurs and businesses are are anxious and are just ready to shift gears towards this direction. Uh, but how how did we start in AI? Uh, we, uh, I guess the advice that I would give would be to pair technical experience with domain experience into into whatever you whatever avenue you're going into that it's not just domain experience so whether you're a beekeeper vegetation ecologist or a marine biologist and it's not the tech solution alone that is going to solve the problem that you really need to marry those intimately and it's not talking with a tech team once a month it's really this multidisciplinary approach where you're going to get to the root of, you know, what does the solution need to be? You know, how do people need to access it? Because AI alone is great, but it can't be useful in a vacuum. There needs to be a way to access it. There needs to be a way, you know, to deploy it. And they, people need to understand it. I think one of the biggest problems that I have uh, when talking with potential clients is people are either really scared of AI, they think the robots are going to steal their jobs, or they think that AI is the silver bullet and can, and can solve every problem when really neither are true. And so I would make sure that you have a really well-rounded team that can help you bring an AI product to the right people that you've identified a gap and that you've got a strong team uh, with lots of grit and uh, ingenuity uh, to, 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 to make, to build your company. That's what I would say. And does that, thanks Emily, does that resonate with others? <laughs> what Emily said. A hundred percent, I think. Uh, yeah, Emily said most of my answer of having a strong co-founding team um, that has complementary skills. Um, in Nectar's case, what was instrumental for us was taking advantage of all of the startup accelerator, incubator um, programs at the beginnings, even if it was just free office space in a windowless basement um, and access to a few mentors was really pivotal from us kind of crawling out of just a project idea stage into um, an actual business. So the entrepreneurial kind of networks and resources, which I mean, I don't even think I consider myself as an entrepreneur or anything or kind of don't use that term that much, but in terms of starting out, uh, incredibly useful. Um, and Emily, maybe you've seen this in Montreal too, but there's a pretty strong network and ecosystem of these programs, funding sources um, that, that were instrumental to us. And, Any and others like to, yeah, great. Um, I'm not, I'm not a CEO, founder, uh, entrepreneur, uh, but I get to work with, uh, a lot of uh, you guys and I just wanted to say that we are at a point with a great opportunity you know with big challenges come big opportunities right the markets are transforming uh, if we are successful right our economy uh, model and business models would transition to sustainable business models and uh, I would say that 
in everything that you do with your customers, you probably are already seeing uh, some demand as we do, right? When we have to make investments to make sure that our business is sustainable, we look to organizations like you that can help us, for example, assess the risk of wildfire or insects in forests, right? Or understand what are the risks of shipping lines to ocean, you know, mammal life, right? Or, you know, we are in need, you know, of lots of information and data on this. And uh, your organizations are going to be, you know, fundamental for the transformation that we will need. And as you guys know, you know, data is foundational, right? Grand truth data, validating your data, making sure that you have the science to back up of what you do, that you enable this cross collaboration, which sounds so simple, right? But many times I say technology is the easy part, right? Is this governance cross collaboration where we have lots of work to do though. But um, I think that we are going to be needing the likes of you, anyone that would like to jump in, welcome. Uh, we are at a pivotal change for sustainability. I think that Hopefully, if we are successful, new markets are emerging. You know, the, trans, the economy is transforming to make sure that organizations have the data that you guys will provide. There will be the year of biology, ecology coming for sure, right? Um, so that organizations can make um, data informed decisions that you provide to betterment of the environment. That's it's, it's an exciting time for organizations like you and completely you know, excited to see all of you succeed and help all of us move along. And what resources does AI for Earth, Microsoft AI for Earth provide or support that could help um, in this instance with startups or these ideas to, to help um, put these ideas um, to the forefront? Uh, we want to democratize the access to technology, right, for environmental solutions. That is something that nobody should be worried about, right? Um, open data source, open data solutions, you know, the computational power of the cloud is now available. You don't have to have a closet rack with, you know, 15 CPUs to do or train your models, right? What used to take, you know, three weeks, four weeks to train a model now can take just a matter of minutes. So we want to make sure that uh, all of these organizations have access to the technology, have access to education, have a way of hosting these data sets, right? That we can, you know, pay for that. We want to democratize, you know, access of these technologies I tell you that I see one challenge, for example, and that is how could we get to all of us not trying to solve the same problem? For example, how can we easier identify when AI is a model is generalizable? Sounds simple, but it could be a little hard. But you know, one of the things that we see often is organizations working on the same problem in different places of the world. Imagine, this is a little bit rhetorical, but imagine if we could, you know, instead of, you know, 10 people working on the same problem in 10 places in the world, if we could build on the work of others, right? Could we accelerate, you know, our pace? Uh, that it's needed, right, to address uh, sustainability. So what we have to offer is don't worry about the technology. We'll have the technology. Uh, we tell you how to use the technology, leverage the technology for the solutions that you're thinking and, you know, figure out ways in which you can collaborate with others. So perhaps, you know, I don't know, Toffer and Indra can work together. It sounds simple, but um, I don't know, you know, when AI is better when it's localized or solving a problem or generalized, you know, those are the kind of things that I think of. Sorry, I think I went on a tangent right there. <laughs> no, I think that's fantastic. I mean, has anyone any reflections on 
um, working together in partnerships um, on these kind of issues that Alma highlighted. Yeah, so for, for, uh, yes, partnerships are really important. Actually, one of the biggest things I think that does hold us all back, it, like you said, is not access to technology. Uh, it's it's there. Everyone loves to build technology. They love to build like new technology. They have great ideas. They want to build it, but they refuse. They don't share it enough, and they don't share data either. And this isn't just a technology problem. This is like a researcher's problem. Um, people aren't willing to share data, even in situations that don't apply to the research they're doing. And it's it's it, I see I see this hold back conservation almost every day in the work that we do. Um, and if, you know, if I was gonna, if I was gonna, you know, <laughs> go on a mission to, to get, be, be incentivize people to start sharing data sets and share um, results. But it, it, to what you're saying um, about everything being sort of like localizable or generalizable, um, I feel like all conservation is ultimately local. Whether it's you know protecting the oceans, whether it's fighting fires, whether it's you know agriculture, these are all things that are incredibly local, and local people are the ones who are there. What really helped us get going was actually suggesting this to somebody, them saying, yes, please build that. And then once we did that, we were on the hook. I couldn't, we couldn't build it the way we wanted to. We had to build it fast enough to get it into their hands. And the first time we put it there, it barely worked. And the next 10 times it barely worked. But the point was that we were already on the hook, like the people we had to answer to. And so often in, I'm not sure if it's like this in, in the places where you guys work, but there's, there's like an inverse relationship between how much you talk about something and uh, a great idea, especially in conservation, where you get a lot of a lot of kind of like glowing feedback and like talk less about it and like build it as quickly as possible um, because you're gonna feel great talking about it but they're not actually getting them, getting what needs to get done done. Um, and that that includes collaboration. Like it's best to collaborate when you, when you have more than an idea, you know, build, build something, try something and then go ask for help. Like what I'm always saying. Uh, and don't try and don't re, don't try and build the whole vertical pipeline. You know, build one piece that nobody else is building, and then give you know offer it, offer it, give it away if you can. And work on less sexy problems. Everyone loves to work on. Sorry guys, I'm on I'm on a rant right now. Everyone <laughs> loves to work on like really really great analysis tools or really really awesome hardware. You know, try and build one of those places in between that no one wants to work on. Does that resonate with you, Emily? I can see yeah. you. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, as a scientist, we all want to make sure that we have something built and tested before we talk about it at all. And that's really counter the startup movement where, where CEOs of other types of, of startups you're expected to say, oh, we can do that. We can do that. Yeah, we've got it. We've got it already. And you hype it something so much, you know, like Topher was saying, and you really don't have anything to offer. And, and, and I feel like, I don't know if it's a strength or a weakness of founders who are scientists, because we tend to just say, I don't want to talk about anything until it's ready to deliver. And actually, we need to be talking about it more because we can find more collaboration. We could maybe accelerate our process um, without overselling and lying about something that we don't actually have. But one of the one of the problems that we've had, and I'm really curious to hear from the other panelists here, is that the, the clients that we work with that don't want to share their data, they, they've spent millions of dollars in acquiring the data, they are, you know, monitoring sensitive areas, they are doing it to be in compliance with environmental um, impact assessments and environmental monitoring, it's the government. And um, this, this funding that's contingent on things being open source, really, how do we make a living when we're expected to give away our code or give away our clients' data for free? It, it's not a model that, that we can make a living on. And so it's a great concept, but I'm wondering how does that idea help move forward entrepreneurs and people who are innovative and who are putting a lot of money and time into research and development and then we're supposed to give away our data sets and give away our technology i think there's a way to make to democratize ai by lowering the technical bar by lowering the price by lowering you know all of the entry points but without making it 
free, um, I think there needs to be a, a middle road so that people can still make a living, but people can still have access to these powerful tools. I, I mean, I, I literally people talk, but I, I completely agree. I think that it's, it's, it's really important that whether it's free or not, that's actually, I think that actually a business around being able to sell, with, sell your technology, sell your, sell your data, that would be really great. And actually I'm all for that. But sometimes people just won't even do that because it gets in the way of the research. So, so it's it's up to us to incentivize people to share, and even create a market for them to do it. You know, um, and so sometimes that comes from us, like allowing them to look beyond what they thought the data was useful for. And so we spend too much time trying to do that, trying to convince people that like we can help you do more with your data if you just share with other people. You know, and like we'll embargo what you're looking for. These these are some things that we think about. So, I'd love to hear some of the thoughts. Yeah, I think uh, if I may say here, the one that has no business of her own, <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, these business models, right, are important. And one, you know, may think that the value is in the data, right? Um, but maybe the value is not in the data. Maybe the value is on you interpreting and having the ability to determine or find the insights in the data so that you can enable others to make a decision, right? Um, so it, it, could be, it could be tricky, you know, this open source thing though, but as, as you, you know, think your business models, think of the value add that you bring to the table, right? The data, you know, it is like, a raw material that could be useful, but it is you and your services that make it useful, the data itself, right? It could be open, it's open, there it is, you know, public data sets for remote sensing, there they are. They're available for free, everyone can go grab them. It is you guys taking the data, transforming it and creating insight and solutions for others to make better decisions. So. I would suggest that your business models should be centering on the value that you bring to the table. Um, the code and data, yeah, open your code. Who will be able to do it, do something with it? They need to have the expertise you have, right? So anyway, I'm just suggesting. Thanks, Amna. Any reflections, Evan or Indra? I saw you you nodding your heads. No, I think it makes total sense, right? Like with, for for example, in our case with satellites, you can make you can apply a machine learning to it. You can make the most fanciest map, but if no one's using it, what's the value of it, right? So I think definitely productizing it, making it frictionless as possible for the customer to use those insights. That's where the value is. So fully agree with what you said, Alma. It's about how can we provide value to the end customer. Our customer doesn't care about if it's a satellite, a drone, or a helicopter. They want to have the insights to improve their decision making. I think that's where the value is, and that actually allows for for sharing the data before that, like as you mentioned, the raw data. And we do that with some research university where we just freely share some of the data that we've processed or collected, because I think that will. That's I mean I think in our field where we are all working in, we're more open to that because we're on a mission to do something bigger than our own companies. I think. Uh, so I think we're already a little bit more open to that compared to other industries, but there's definitely more, more collaboration needed to, to share data and then learn from each other's products and, and how we complement uh, each other. So I think that's what has all been said before as well. Thanks. And I guess moving on, thinking about access to data and data democratization, want to shift gears, I guess, to think about equitable sustainability, to the, the, the conference um, theme, the workshop theme is thinking about equitable, su 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 uh, equitable sustainability. So how are you addressing equity issues or is it something that you're thinking about or want to think about in future in what you're doing? Um, and I can see you, Indra, in front of me, so I'll pass straight back to you. How are you addressing um, equity? I think especially if you work in something as climate or biodiversity, I think even more interesting topic for maybe later. Um, but there, I think equity is so important, right? We cannot just protect only the trees in California. 
all the other trees across the world where we might not have enough resources to protect them now, equally important or maybe even more important. So equity is super important working on these topics and should be at the core when growing the company. So I think diversity is, is part of it, of course, and um, taking into account different views on, on forest and trees and collaboration helps with that as well. Listening to others, being open-minded and really try to value that. It's not just another metric, it's important, right? Equity is important if you want to solve a real problem. Uh, so it should be not a side thought, it should be at the core. At least we try and we can always do better. I'm not saying we're doing it perfect, far from it, I guess. But as least if you continuously take that with you in every decision you make, I think that will help to move it forward. But curious Thanks. about others. Yeah, me too. Anyone have any strong feelings about you know the issues they're addressing with equity and sustainability? Yeah, I mean, I think in, uh, I think it's it's necessary for us all to be inventive about ways in which we we add extra value, which allows us to be more equitable. So. Uh, whether it's measuring carbon or carbon outputs when it comes to climate change, co-benefits are like a totally new uh, way that's for us to go with that, like biodiversity measurements, uh, ecosystem services, but there is no like global market for that, right? That the, the value for those is a local thing and the value for those both helps local communities, but it has to have some actual economic value to them. And I think it's it's incumbent upon us and a whole new generation of, of entrepreneurs and, and, um, and people to actually invent ways that that becomes valuable and there are markets for that because it's not going to be the same way that carbon gets sold um so i'm really we're trying some things i hope other people are trying better things you know i often worry about all the work that we are doing right it is really so centered in north america and europe right i often think about leaving behind the South Hemisphere. And I often worry about, you know, the major impacts of climate change um, are going to be in the South Hemisphere, right? So I try to influence uh, within my realm of influence um, at work uh, for us to start thinking about how we can, you know, start focusing in the South Hemisphere, um, you know, more. Um, data, technology, solutions, um, skills, right? Um, I mean, there is a fear of artificial intelligence that it's founded. It will replace jobs. It's already replacing jobs. And we are not training people fast enough. We are not attracting new talent fast enough to this new skill sets, right, that are needed on data analysis, machine learning, though. So the fourth industrial revolution, yeah, you know, I I worry about that, you know, thinking of, you know, equality, like, are we really doing what we can to skill people? Are we focusing really on the regions, right, that are going to be hit the hardest on, on climate change? I would say that we are not doing hardly enough to address the problem. Um, and thank you for raising this ability uh, to, to that important question. Emily, can I, that's really important, um, Alma, to, to highlight how we really need to be thinking about the areas um, of, that are most critical and, and in need. Um, can I pass on to, to Emily as well? I know that the ethics is at the core of your business and yeah. equity issues. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we try, we focus a lot on the AI development and then the use of their tools afterwards. And, and we see them as two really separate things. So, so something that's maybe not talked quite enough about is how data hungry AI is and that there needs to be an obscene amount of label data to create a training set. And that is what a lot of the investment is in for capacity building for an AI solution is that there, there needs to be so much data labeling upfront. And this part 
is often not equitable. It's often outsourced to people who are not trained, who are not getting a living wage. Um, and, and so we want to make sure from the data labeling to the use that the whole life cycle of creation and deployment is as equitable as, as possible. So for us at Whale Seeker, that means that all of our data are labeled by trained marine biologists and they are paid a living wage. We don't outsource to anyone else. And then, you know, all of the steps along the way, we, we have turned down uh, collaborations with people who have wanted to add more sensors, es essentially making our solution out of reach for the common person. And what we are moving towards is lowering that bar to access a powerful AI solution instead of raising it and making sure that only people who are rich or only people who are in the elite have access to this. We wanna make sure that it's powerful enough for governments and oil and gas industries to use, but cheap enough and accessible enough technically to anyone who's got a drone um, you know, can, can access our solutions. That's our interpretation of equity and ethical and democratization of, of AI in our use case. Um, it's not solving the problem on a global scale, but it's how we keep a really tight rein on each step within Whale Seeker. Thank you. And I, I saw Evan um, nodding his head um, during what you were saying. Um, I'd like to pass on to you, Evan. Oh, yeah. I was just laughing a little bit because you're making me look bad. I was looking for data labeling outsourcing uh, this week or digitization. I um, have hundreds of labeled data records from hives that are just on pen and paper that I'm trying to digitize in a efficient way. Um, but yeah, I think everybody addressed, I think, the, a lot of key points um, on the multiple levels of equity um, in AI and also uh, the natural world. Um, I think one, uh, I, mean, I guess one thing I could add is I think equity also involves like uh, not only just the people involved and more diversity and training in AI, um, as well as access to the resources and computing power, um, which is often uh, cost prohibitive or, or uh, out of reach for other reasons. Um, and I think one, mod or one not full solution is just having more uh, support and programs, whether it's government funding, private groups, um, like there's a Microsoft has helped us with cloud computing credits uh, generously. Um, that all helps reduce these barriers. Thank you. And it's been a fascinating conversation, you know, thinking about access to data, thinking about equitable access, thinking about which critical ecosystems we need to be focusing on. Um, but unfortunately, our time has come to an end. Um, and, you know, I'd like to thank all the panelists, um, Alma Cardenas, Emily Chariotissier, Evan Henry, Indra Dembeka, and Tofa White, thank you very much for the conversation. And um, yes, um, I think everyone will have enjoyed the, the discussion very much. And I hope you'll reach out to the panelists if there's particular interest um, and continue the conversation further. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was uh, a pleasure to uh, be with you today and learn about you guys. So thank you, Kathleen. Thanks very much. Thank you.